Okay. And where is she? Just one second, we'll get started. Um, we're having some technical issues and I'm not seeing. Okay, I have two phone numbers um, up here as attendees and I wanted to um, clarify who it is so I can get your phone number off the screen, your name up. Um, I have one starting with 379. Who is this? You have to allow them to speak. I did. Oh, okay. But they have to unmute themselves. And then I have another one. Oh wait, that that's, that's Bryn. Ends in 8256. 8256 and 0275. You may speak. Hmm. I think. Well, they might just. One's Bryn. I guess I could just say for right now. Did, did Ted call in? He's got his video and phone. I don't know if that counts. That's true. Uh, Ted, I believe, renamed. We've got, no, we've got his name on both. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, but we're just still having some technical issues. Um, we're waiting for our director to get logged in. Your director can't get in. Tell him to restart his computer because that's what I did. Okay. Because they said you might have to. Uh... Okay, well, we can get started now. Um, so, Chairman, I gave it to you. Okay. And we're recording. Uh, welcome to the planning and zoning meeting. My name is Don Michaelman. And before we officially start, I would like to have the members of the commission introduce themselves as I mentioned their name. Ted? I'm Ted Gamboji, and I have the red plaid shirt. <laughs> Stan. Good morning, Stan Goligoski. Waving my hand here. <laughs> Tom. Good morning, Tom Hutchison. Um, I also have a red plaid shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> Greg. Greg Lazell, I have a gray plaid shirt on. <laughs> Butch. <laughs> it's Butch Tracy uh, in green. <laughs> and we, I, I hereby call to order the Thursday, January 28, 2021 public hearing of the City of Prescott Planning Commission. Uh, we have joining us uh, from the City Council, Council Member Good, Council Member Siska, 
Council Member Rusing. Did I miss anybody from the council? Nope, that's it. Okay. This is an open public hearing and is being tape recorded and videotaped by the city. The proceedings are being televised by representatives of the public media. The public, local cable and or radio stations may also rebroadcast. The number of commission members present is six. It will require four votes for a majority. As some individuals may be attending, well, really all individuals are attending this remotely. All parties wish, wishing to be heard, including commission members, are asked to state their name prior to speaking in order to ensure accurate minutes. Members of the public when called upon are required to state their name and address for the record so that we may know who is speaking and be able to contact them later at a later date if necessary. The first item on the agenda is the January 14th, 2021 minutes. Are there any corrections? I hear no corrections. Is there a motion? This is Greg Lazell. I like to make a motion to approve January 14, 2021 minutes of uh, the P and Z meeting. We have a motion. Is there a second to the motion? It's Butch Tracy. I'll second it. All right. We have a motion and has been seconded. Any further discussion? If not, uh, Kaylee, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Butch Tracy. Present. Greg Lazell. Here. Well, this is, I guess, voting for the minutes. Yeah. Correct. Yes, I'm here. I was taking Butch's lead. I wasn't paying attention. Thomas Hutchison. I vote yes. Stan Goligoski. Yes. Ted Gamboji. Yes. Don Michaelman. Yes. Motion passes 6-0. Okay. Next item on the agenda is LDC 21-001, discussion of a proposed update to section 2.4.49, telecommunications facilities in the land development code. Tammy, to you. And I am going to chance, just hand it over to Bryn Stotler, Community Development Director. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Commission and also our visiting council members and members of the public who have tuned in for this meeting. We appreciate your attendance this morning and thanks for your patience as we ironed out some of the um, glitchy uh, aspects of doing our meetings this way. Uh, finally got everybody on, so here we go. Um, I just wanted to do a quick introduction on the discussion that we're going to have today. I wanted to refresh the Commission's memory on the fact that um, back in October, we were asked to bring a study session to the city council regarding um, different options for um, potential adjustments to our wireless and telecommunications facilities code. Our code was adopted in 2003 and has not been updated since that time. So it could stand to be modernized. At the time we delivered the study session to the council, um, there were three directions or specific requests that came out of that uh, meeting as a result of the presentation and discussion at that time. That was October 27th. Those three items um, were not huge changes to our code necessarily, but let me just recap um, the fact that the council was most interested in requiring stealth treatment in residential zones. Um, I think that's something that our existing LDC strongly suggested and encouraged, but didn't necessarily mandate. So we've made that adjustment within the drafts that you're gonna see and discuss today. Um, a, prefer a stated preference for co-location, meaning that multiple um, vendors would utilize the same towers in order to minimize the placement of additional towers. And we already had that as a part of our LDC, but we have kind of strengthened the language. T uh, Tammy will review that with you. And then um, the provision of a CMU walled equipment space, um, which is also something that we have seen customarily with most, if not all of our tower installations. And while that was um, referenced in our LDC, it was not mandated. So we've incorporated that um, revision as well. And just uh, to set the table for the conversation before Tammy gets into the specifics of the code um, proposals, 
we aren't ruling anything out. And keep in mind that our existing code, while it could stand to be modernized, isn't necessarily um, incapable of receiving our tower applications and handling, and in other words, the process is working as it's intended, but we do think that the code could stand to be modernized in terms of definitions, references. And today you'll see an alternative approach um, that references uh, handling them in a slightly different way. This is in no way intended to be um, a mandate that we go in that direction. It's intended to be a, a discussion starter. So with that, I'll hand it over to Tammy and she can review the more specific aspects of these uh, proposed code changes and the updates that we've made to this language. And you guys can start discussing um, your uh, preferences and um, see if we can distill down um, into revised drafts uh, that we can bring back to you guys for additional discussion and public participation, and then later to bring to council if you are so inclined. So thanks for giving me the, a moment to set the table. Thank you, Bryn. Um, Tammy DeWitt, Community Planner with the City of Prescott. Uh, good morning, Chairman and members of the Commission. So we're, this, these, just so you know, the, these were that were handed out, the drafts, they were rough drafts. We wanted to put something together with some ideas that we had and some proposed languages, like Bryn said, to update the language um, in our land development code for these type of facilities. Um, so, we, our goal was just to create development criteria to permit these facilities. The allowance for height to exceed the zoning district's height. This is something the county just did. Um, it was approved in December of 2020 um, for the county where basically they just approved it to allow them by right, um, doubling the height allowance of the zoning districts. So in a residential zoning district, they're allowed a 30 foot height, go 60 feet, commercial allowed 50, go 100 feet. And I forgot what the industrial was, but um, <clears throat> so we were kind of looking at what, what they did. And that was one of the direction too from one of the council members to kind of look at what the county did. Um, another one was required concealment of facilities to the stealth towers. Um, that is what we're seeing coming through in the industry mostly in residential areas and in commercial is the stealth towers because they want them to somewhat try to blend in and not stand out as much as they have in the past. The screen equipment compounds, which they are required to do through um, FCC, and they usually do that anyways to help mitigate the sounds, mostly if they're in a more developed area, and to encourage the co-location, which our code already does. Okay, so the current process for processing um, wireless facilities is the need for a special use permit exceeding the zoning height allowance, which in our, re in our residential is 35, in commercial it's 50, and in then industrial it's 50. So if they're exceeding, um, but that, in that process, it goes through the Planning and Zoning Commission and then the final approval through the, the um, city council, it goes through planning and zoning and then go to the city council. So for some background, as Bryn stated, there's been no changes that have been done since the adoption of the land development code in 2003 to this section of the code. Now let's go back to 2003 and what did we have at the time? We still had landlines, hardwired landlines. We had dial up internet. We had cell phones such as this that could just make a call. No pictures, no texting. It was just phone calls, limited data capacity. I think I had 300 minutes. So when I was on my computer and my friends were trying to call me, they called me on my cell phone and use up all my minutes. Um, then we went to flip phones, which we could start taking pictures. You couldn't send them. You might be able to text but we didn't have that capacity yet. And if you did have to text, you had to hit the numbers to get to the right letter to send a text and who knew what you were sending. Then we went to the, the slider phones. If some of you had these smaller phones, the slider keyboards, wrong way, where you can start, start sending texts, take better pictures. You might be able to send pictures. You know, we started to get more technology. Um, that's when we started to see a little bit more of Wi-Fi with the Wi-Fi in our homes, we started to see this is an iPod. That was the beginning of the iPhone. Um, 
you needed Wi-Fi, you can check your emails, you can download apps. It was the start of that. Take pictures, maybe post pictures. Um, but this was pre our cell phones. And now we have our phones, our little mini computers, and that most people, it's glued to them. Me, I leave mine in places all the time. And these take a lot more than what we used to have. So that's what we're in now. If you also look at the towers that we had in play, they were lattice towers that would go up to 200 feet in remote areas, or they were the ones with the tie wires. Technology and engineering has gone, come so much um, since then that what we are seeing with the new towers, they are engineered to collapse on themselves. The only time they fall, if there's some weird thing, an earthquake, tornado, uh, uh, sinkholes, we've seen some things in, the, in the, some of the data people send us that uh, if they're next to a sinkhole, they may fall. But most of the, in, the towers that we see now are engineered to collapse on themselves. So that's why in some areas you've seen a reduction of the fall zone requirements. But like Bryn said, that this was discussed at the study session at city council and staff was given direction to come up with a proposal and bring it forward for consideration. And, and this is just for a discussion to kind of see if, we're, if you feel what we're going in the right direction or if we're totally off topic and you don't see it going in that direction and want us to come back with something else. So the big thing that this, um, both of these um, did in the code was to uh, propose height allowances beyond the zoning districts. So for residential, the single family residential, we looked at 50 feet. 50 feet may allow co-location depending on the area and what's around it. Um, but usually with the 50 foot tower, you won't see it. They don't have enough room on the tower where the equipment goes and down below to allow for co-location, um, but these would be concealed. We're putting that in that they're concealed, 50 foot high and single family. Then um, for uh, multifamily and light commercial, and these are not set in stone, these zoning districts either, and it's something we can change. Um, we're proposing 60 feet, which would allow enough height to allow for the co-location for at least one other carrier to come in and that they will also be concealed. Um, then for uh, the commercial, more commercial, the BG and BR allow for 70 feet and be also be concealed stealth. And then for industrial up to 80 feet, because they're mostly in um, more remote areas sometimes. And then um, that they wouldn't need to be concealed, but that is something that we could consider if that's something that you feel they should be stealth in that area too. So these Cammie, are just, yes. Cammie, Tom here, Tom Hutchison. Sure. Um, sorry, I'm a little slow on a draw on this question, but um, as background, do we know what's, what's new from the FCC? What are, what are the federal regs now or currently uh, promulgated to be going forward. Do we know anything about that? Um, we have, I have not heard about any proposed changes at this time. There, so. I, there was a, there was an FCC directive, I think in late 2018, that, that, uh, that changed the regs. And I'm wondering if we're cognizant of that. If this, if this is background, is this part of that plan to take that into account? I'd have to look at the 2018 change to see, but most of the time what we're seeing with the FCC is deregulating and taking more rights away from jurisdictions to be able to regulate these. So they um, aren't making, go ahead. Let's ask Matt if he's got any information on the 18 update. Our city attorney, Matt Padrecki is with us uh, on the meeting. I, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that and certainly, um, what we're attempting to do with the changes is to come into compliance with um, the existing rules. The statute hasn't changed at all. There are usually, uh, as, as these things evolve, um, case law and changes to the code of federal regulations that we're, we're kind of keeping an eye on. Um, and that kind of gets you to that um, 
I remember when we were doing the training on this, kind of five rules that sort of popped out uh, as part of this statute of what uh, municipalities are allowed to do uh, in terms of uh, regulations and what they're not allowed to do. So certainly the Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996 had a very wide um, scope that it wanted to increase uh, cell towers and the use of wireless technology. But there were uh, five limitations on what a city can do. Um, unusually, the federal government did not preempt local control on the siting of cell towers. Uh, but they did impose five limitations. And those five limitations are always kind of subject to review by the courts and changes to the code of federal regulations. Um, you'll recall that the five are, you cannot discriminate between providers. Uh, you can't prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting personal wireless service. You have to act within a reasonable time. That was that shot clock training we did. Uh, you cannot deny on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequency emissions, and the denial of the application must be in writing supported by substantial evidence. That last one kind of came out as a U.S. Supreme Court case. So um, regarding the 2018 um, uh, information you requested, we'll take a look at that. My sense is, what is, is kind of what Tammy said, is the federal government, continues to work more towards a deregulation as opposed to more regulation regarding uh, wireless cell technology. But certainly, I would say that what we're presenting to you is not part of the 2018 changes or um, uh, regulations specifically. It comes more from, you know, what, is, what are the changes in the law since 2003? Now the statute of course hasn't changed, but there are um, now a plethora of cases that explain exactly what those five limitations are. So this is trying to just kind of update uh, those and also meet the mandate of the request from the city council to, for you guys to take a look at this. So now that we're in sort of this um, work study environment, this is sort of the sausage making of legislation um, this is where you guys get to kind of get your hands dirty and kind of come up with some concepts that you think are important uh, for us to present to the city council, kind of meeting those three goals, I think, that Tammy went over as to what the request was for. And in doing a quick search online really quick, um, it looks like in 2018, it was step in the FCC's ongoing ever, efforts to remove regulatory barriers in regards to the small cells and the implementation of the small cells, which we're mostly seeing in the right-of-ways. And those are mandated under different regulations in state law and federal law. So in regards to the small cell um, um, development and expansion, those are done in the right of way and our regulations are don't pertain to that. That's regulated through other state statutes in Arizona. So that's just, what the 2018 change was, was for the small cell. De de um, and, and piggybacking on that a little bit, Tammy, um, about two years ago, we changed our right of way ordinance to include small cell towers. Uh, in the right of way based on a state law that, that came mm. out about two years ago. And again, that's part of this, this generalized concept of more towards deregulation than regulation. Um, but we have some very minor ability to <laughs> regulate small cells, but not much. The state law said, thou shalt cities and towns allow for small cells in your, in your communities. With very little guidance and very little uh, zoning oversight. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, that was very helpful. Tammy, this is Gre uh, Greg Lazell. Just a, a question, how you want to proceed with this. Do you want to go through your entire presentation of the first uh, proposal or do we, you want comment from bullet point from bullet point? Let me get through my presentation and then we'll kind of get in more into it. I think with the, the this first one, the discussion, I mean, the big change is I believe for both proposals is to, um, for the proposed height allowance and the change in the process. 
So here's the proposed height allowance that was, uh, that's in them. Um, then the other change in it, and these are in both drafts, that in all districts, the Board of Adjustment shall have the authority to vary the height restrictions listed in this section upon the request of the applicant and the satisfactory showing of need for a greater height. With its conditional use permit request, the applicant shall submit such technical information or other justifications as are necessary to document the need for the additional height to the satisfaction of the board adjustment. And the reason why we thought of going this approach, you know, the cell towers are a use that would be allowed by right. So it's no longer a land use decision. Um, the question before that comes before us is a, a um, a reduction of the, uh, and I had it in my head. Um, so the Board of Adjustments is a quasi-judicial board that looks at relaxations of codes, like height restrictions, setback reductions. So it, and when we were thinking about this, we were thinking of the conditional use permit to go through the Board of Adjustments um, because they are, that's their job and what how state statutes has created the Board of Adjustments is they, look at reductions in, in code re requirements. So the relaxation of the code. So they would have to show the need and show the ju justification for the need. And it would go through the board of adjustments. Like I said, that's a quasi judicial board and any um, decisions made by the board of adjustment is appealable to superior court. So this wouldn't come through planning and zoning or to the city council because it's no longer a land use decision. It's a code requirement and it's relaxation of a code for something that's allowed by right. So that's the reason why um, it was decided, it was thought of to go in this direction. Tammy, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, may I make a comment? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to note that the CUP falling under the Board of Adjustment varies by jurisdiction. So there's nothing magical about the CUP going straight to the Board of Adjustment. Some jurisdictions, including the county, have CUPs heard by their Planning and Zoning Commission and then ultimately the Board of Supervisors. So it's just a structural variation that's available to discuss as a possible code amendment. It doesn't mean that it has to be the, the direction that we go, but as Tammy mentioned, when you allow things by right in the code, the Board of Adjustments role is to review and relax code standards based on factual information about the site and the proposed use of the site. So again, as she mentioned, not a land use decision, more of a code relaxation decision. And in our particular jurisdiction, the CUP to do such code relaxations falls under the Board of Adjustments purview rather than the Planning and Zoning Commission. That's not by any specific intent. We just feel that it's most appropriate if you adjust the code to allow something by right that the relaxation of that code, the questions on that go to the Board of Adjustment. And um, I'll just kind of weigh in briefly here. You know, the Board of Adjustment through their process is still a public hearing process. Uh, so, you know, normal notice will go out to the community and individual citizens or residents or anyone who has anything to say about a particular request uh, has the right to come to the Board of Adjustment meeting and put their concerns on the record, just like the Planning and Zoning Commission. Yes. We post the property, we send notices out, the same as a, as a the special use permit. So the, the rewrite draft, this was something um, I had put together um, in looking online, there was a lot of models and what they do is they update to bring it up to more current codes and, and language. So the whole rewrite of the, of that section of the LDC was to update the language and the definitions to make it more modern and more what we see in the industri industry now. Then to add the criteria to allow the towers to exceed the height allowance of the zoning district, which that's in both of the codes and to simplify the code to make it where it's more readable and easier to follow. Um, to update the current ordinance Back in 2003, um, about that time, there was a, um, 
a document created between the count the county the Prescott Valley and Prescott got together and they created a kind of a, a, a model not a model it was a it was a document created with some recommendations about what to put into your wireless codes. And a lot of the language that we see in our current code was from that. But remember in 2003, what we were seeing was we had the lattice towers that were very tall in height to get, cause they were covering bigger areas. Um, we didn't need all the, the as much um, bandwidth as we do now. And then we also saw the towers with the guy wires. Like I said, they were in remote areas or they were very tall and they aren't, now they're more streamlined, they're shorter, they have, they, they're just designed differently. So this takes out some of that outdated language and requirements. Some of the stuff that we had in our, our code, we can't ask for because it's federally protected. Um, sometimes the location of other towers is protected by um, federal requirements because it becomes um, a security issue because um, you do rely on the wireless facilities when there's an emergency in place. Um, it adds new definitions from the FCC regulations that, from, that have been adopted that we need to comply with and we don't have a lot of that, any of that in our current regulations. Updates criteria to allow the towers to exceed the height allowance of the zoning district and adds criteria for concealed commu telecommunications facilities. So that's what's due putting in our current ordinance. So in conclusion, both versions create development criteria to allow the facility to exceed the zoning district height requirements. Um, both of them are, like we said, this is just a, an idea was the both proposals requires a CUP to be approved by the Board of Adjustment. The Board of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial board elected by the City Council and their findings are binding and like I said, appealable to Superior Court. So, and they look at relaxations instead of land use allowances. So um, that's kind of what we were wanting to throw at you today was that the rewrite of the two or the, either the rewrite or the update you know, there's some things that still probably need to be fleshed out in them, but the main crux of it is the allowance to create the development criteria for the allowance and the process. And I think once we kind of figure out what you want, if we're going in the right direction with these, then we can kind of flesh it out a little bit more and get you a better draft more to look at and get more into the weeds with it. So we are looking for your comments, your ideas. Are we going in the right direction? And um, if you have any comments, uh, please let us know. And I'll Mr. stop now and open it up. <laughs> Mr. Chair, this is Greg Lozell. Can, can I make a comment? Uh, first off, I, I think that uh, going to the Board of Adjustments for height variance is, that's, that's a perfect job for them when I was on the board we were doing church steeples and uh, flagpoles. So this height variance falls right under their, what they're already doing. So I, I, I agree with that. I do have a question though. If we were to approve the, the new height limits and let's say in a neighborhood, uh, the last one we did uh, in Yabpai Hills was 50 feet, uh, would that be an administrative call or is there still a public hearing on a cell tower? It'd be an administrative because if that's we're creating a development criteria to allow it by right. So if it's a 50 foot tower and it meets the development criteria created, it wouldn't have to go through any public process. Okay. Um, I, and I'm just going to come out. I think 50 feet in a, in a residential area uh, written in, in proverbial stone, when you can't put a flag over 30 feet is exceeding I think in that area, it's an it's excess. And the reason I say that is we, we have, uh, we saw the camouflage or I forget your, your terminology on that, the, how stealth. you hide it. Yeah. Stealth. They're limited on stealth. You're putting a uh, non-indigenous tree in areas that would stand out just as much as a cell tower. So I, I don't know. I think maybe we, I, I think that uh, 50 feet, and I'm not speaking of uh, multifamily or industrial or commercial areas, but in a, in a uh, residential area, I think 
50 feet uh, is excessive uh, for it to just be written that they can go 50 feet. If they can prove a hardship to the Board of Adjustments to go over 30, then you know I, I think that's more conducive to a residential area. And, uh, and I, well, my last comment is simplifying the code is always good. So those are the end of my comments. Okay, thank you. Other commission members, comments? And what we can do about the, the height and the residential is we can do some research on what height that they may need to be to even have their equipment and stuff on it um, to see if it's doable even to do it 30 feet. Um, and what, what the standard is out there that we're seeing. Yeah, I'm Tom Hutchison, Tom Hutchison here. Tom? Yes. Hello. Yes. Um, I'd like to make a comment or two. Um, back when I got paid for a living as a senior leader at Ford Motor Company, any business case that came in front of us um, had to have benchmark data. We, we, we wanted to compare what was being proposed to what everybody else was doing. Um, and the idea of, of copying with pride uh, was alive and well. So in the same, same vein, I'm, I'm thinking about what's, what's Flagstaff tell us about height requirements? How about uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico? Or you know, similar terrains, uh, topographical terrains that we have here. How, mm -hmm. how does that look in other cities? We, we presented that to the city council at the October joint uh, study session. And Bryn, you're the one that did the pre-station. Do you wanna kind of elaborate on that? Sure, uh, thanks for the question, Commissioner Hutchison. Um, yes, part of the context of the presentation done at the end of October to council was to uh, look at other um, communities, mostly within Arizona, um, but that had similar topographical features as Prescott. And we looked at Payson, we looked at Flagstaff, we looked at Durango, Colorado. We presented um, what their codes um, find mm -hmm. that they have uh, codified to um, have acceptable as far as cell tower applications. They don't vary that greatly across those three jurisdictions and some of the others that we looked at. And their codes were framed uh, somewhat differently than ours. So there are options in other jurisdictions, but I will say that council did not seem to resonate with any one approach of any one of the other jurisdictions that we uh, reviewed for them. And they came away with those three specific directions, which were basically just modifications of components already found in our code. Um, one of the things that I think council did dialogue about some uh, in the October study session was the, um, the possibility of prohibiting towers in the residential zones. And I think that from our past uh, trainings to both planning and zoning commission and council, whether done by our team or by the legal department, um, what we know is that in Prescott, having uh, towers only allowed in commercial zones is simply not feasible because we have so much residential area that is um, quite a distance away from commercial zones and we don't um, encourage or endorse or practice spot zoning, meaning we would not rezone individual parcels within residential subdivisions to a commercial zoning simply to accommodate a cell tower because that would also open up that parcel for other commercial uses that residential occupants would probably not find desirable. So um, again, we're straddling the fence here across many different variations of code approaches. And one of the reasons that we took the tack of um, allowing certain heights by right is that per our inventory of existing cell towers in Prescott, we know that 50 feet is probably the, the lower end of what is required for most coverage areas and most applications ask for 50 feet or greater. And again, having those allowances by right more aligns our code with the federal framework, which is that we are not to prohibit the use and availability of wireless communications facilities to residents um, per the federal, uh, federal law. So 
Uh, I hope that explains that. We again, we didn't glom on to one or or another of the um, other communities codes that we looked at. If if council had resonated with one or more of those, we would have probably brought them to you more specifically. But we I, did. I guess a number of them. So let me say it this way: um, if you lined up the proposed heights against the cities that you uh, just stated. Does anything stand out? Is, is there anything that's, that's remarkable? Does anything pop? Tammy, if you'd like to, we can jump into that other presentation and look at just the summary slides from those areas. I don't recall there being a um, common anything necessarily. So, no, so nothing remarkable when you look at other we'll, cities. We'll show you our, um, okay. our slides of those areas. Oh, so we looked at Durango first. They were not allowed within or closer than 250 feet to residential zone boundaries. No new tower within 8,000 feet of an existing tower unless demonstrated there is no capacity for additional antennas or needed for data coverage. Must be designed for co-location. Administrative process if all standards are met, so no public process and no stealth requirement in Durango. Mm -hmm. um, but also if you look at the other, so this is a map of Prescott. So the yellow here that you see is all the residential. And so if we <clears throat> didn't allow in, in residential areas, it would be prohibiting them basically within the city. The red is the commercial, all these red are commercial. The uh, orange here, this is multifamily areas. Um, and then the purple colored is industrial. And then these green, green, greeny, whatever color you wanna call it, um, are the SPC, special um, planning communities. So um, if, if that would be a concern of not allowing it in residential and most of our residential is in the higher elevations. So if we just allowed it in commercial and industrial, we would see a lot taller towers. They'd have to exceed, they'd have to be about 200 feet, 200 feet to be able to work in our jurisdiction. Um, let me get back to the other one. And then next we looked at Payson. Payson, a CUP required in residential districts, um, maximum height of 100 feet, lattice type with guy wires prohibited, which you don't, don't see those anymore. All towers should be set back 25 feet from any property line and must be stealth and camouflaged. So their maximum height was 100 feet. And then- I made to add a comment to Payson, they're also surrounded by uh you know, 60, 75 foot. Um, uh, Pine trees. Pine trees. Yes, exactly. Flagstaff, um, stealth telecommunications are permitted by right with a concept site plan approval, which is an administrative process. Residential areas are considered disfavored. So they had different criteria. They had um, favorable, neutral and disfavored areas. Um, and they also had areas though some of their um, highly traveled their scenic areas and from some of their trail systems where um, they had view shed requirements, view requirements <clears> or <throat> they're prohibitive in certain areas. Residential areas are considered as favored and limit the height allowance to 60 feet or five feet above the, or five feet above the average maximum height of the foliage within 200 feet of the proposed facility, but in no case greater than 70 feet with landscape screening around compound, compound to mitigate the visual impact. That seemed pretty hard to implement. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Yes. Yeah. So that one seemed a little, I mean, the kind of like the idea about the favored and disfavored, but if it's allowed by right and you're creating development criteria, then you already kind of created what area is favored and not favored. And then shall allow for co-location. So that's been pretty consistent to allow the co-location, but there for residential was 60 feet. Um, and we are proposing 50 because in the 50 feet, we've seen those that allow at least for one carrier and possibly depending on the terrain and such, possibly in a second carrier. So 
And those are the three that we looked at for that. So I hope that helped a little bit. Thank you, Tammy. You're welcome. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Chair, this is Greg Lozell again. Can I make a comment? Yes. And this is more, I think, directed to our council. Uh, Matt, in, because it sounded like it was a mouthful for Flagstaff, but could we, according to zone, like let's say Timber Ridge, for instance, who has a lot of tall trees that we allow oh, a higher tell sour, cell tower there than, oh, let's say, um, Granite Oaks, which is scrub oak, is that too complicated or is that too restrictive or are we violating federal guidelines by, by setting something up like that? Yeah, I mean, that approach, Greg, is, is more towards the aesthetics than the functionality of coverage. Tammy, I don't know, I th do you have that PowerPoint from legal? Yes. If you're able to pull it up. Yes. We'll take a look at this. And you guys, both both Brent and um, Tammy touched upon the importance that we can't prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the provision of personal wireless service. And I hope we're we'll working off the same one. It's actually, slide 11. Okay. Go back, uh, go back a few, go back one more, one more, right there. <laughs> so, you know, all of this of course is considering the impact of the Telecommunications Act uh, and we're reading it in conjunction with our local land development codes. So one of the things we cannot do as a local jurisdiction is prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the provision of personal wireless services. And Tammy, I think, went into some of the geographical and zoning uh, complications that we have uh, with looking at that zoning map. Um, so I, I think it's probably too, your, your, the request would be probably too difficult to administer uh, and, and hold up in court if a cell tower company can kind of prove that we, by, by, by zoning it that way, will create some sort of significant gap in coverage. And I don't know if you want to go to that next slide, Tammy. It's kind of a, a refresher on the Federal Telecommunications Act. So those significant gap arguments you know, are decided on a case by case um, basis. And it's looking at the coverage gap for a particular applicant. Mm -hmm. And the courts really are concerned with two factors. Uh, the number of potential users affected by the service gap and the severity of the service gap. And you wanna to go to the next one that kind of wrap this kind of up. And this is the burden of the applicant to show um, that the lack of available and technological alternatives to its proposed cell towers. So we can always ask the applicants, you know, do you have alternative sites, alternative designs, alternative technologies and things like that. But my sense, Greg, is if we try to kind of base some sort of regulatory criteria on kind of the, the geography and, you know, the vegetation of Prescott, we'd have a hard time probably upholding that. Uh, Brent, I don't know if that's something you've necessarily taken a look at, but I, I, I mean, I'd counsel kind of avoiding that. Yeah, thank, thanks, Matt. We, we actually haven't uh, looked at segregating design criteria by uh, landscape and or vegetation type. Um, I do understand how that could be prioritized, Greg, and how it could be useful in different scenarios, um, but it really kind of gets us down to the Nats eyelash granular level of trying to implement um, code. It makes it a little more difficult, but it's not out of the question. Thank you, Brent. In the future, Matt, you could just say, Greg, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Greg, you're never wrong. By the hour, Greg. <laughs> you're just mistaken. <laughs> Any other comments? But it goes, it does kind of go back to this 
kind of idea of, of Flagstaff doing the, you know, and we've avoided this, and I'll let Tammy and Brynn kind of give you an idea of why we've avoided this, is having preferred locations, neutral locations, and disfavored locations. And we just thought based on, on the layout of Prescott, it probably would never work. And yeah, we, I, did, we did yeah. see that with our last request when some people were bringing up alternate locations and when the cell company looked at it, there were going to be 150, 200 foot towers were going to be required in order to meet the need. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, staying at Legoski, I'd like to have a few comments here. Um, one, you know, when I looked at back at our Yavapai Hills request, and really to Greg's point, uh, you know, we're looking at these heights here, and the request that came through, one, uh, especially for the multifamily medium density, was, you know, under this, it would be under, it would be a 60-foot height requirement. To me, the, when it even came to PNZ, because they required a special use permit, anything above 35 feet. And, and that really talks to Greg's point about whether it's in Timber Bridge or we're talking about the Alpine Hills with vegetation, that gives us the opportunity to kind of look at it, and Matt, correct if I'm wrong, to look at it and then say, yeah, special use permit would make sense in there. But when we were looking at Yapai Hills, when we denied that, it was really because we're talking about the, the highest hilltop in Yavapai Hills, and it was going to 55 feet. You know, under this, we go to 60, and there would be no, it wouldn't even come before uh, PNZ. So to me, I'd hate to take that away for us to really kind of review that and make a recommendation to, to, the, to the city council. So um, I would prefer to keep it. And if, if that is possible, I know we've talked about the Board of Adjustments and how that applies to them, but then how does that apply to us when there is still a special use permit above those heights? Would that have to change in PNZ? That's my first question. Then I have other comments. Tammy, go ahead. So if, if we have a height allowance that, so, the SUP process is mostly when we look at, when, when applications are looked at by planning and zoning and city council, it's usually a land use decision. Yeah. And in this case, uh, we're allowing them, they're allowed use in the, the zoning districts and we're looking at a development criteria. So that's why the board of adjustment, um, they look at the relaxation of codes for uses that are allowed. So it takes the land use portion out of it, whether it's an allowed land use, and it looks at the development criteria. So that's why the Board of Adjustment, they, they're, that's what they do. They look at development criteria and they, and they still have to show this is still a need, why we need this height instead of meeting the height that's allowed. Sure. And, and that's, you know, to your point, Tammy, you, you, talk, you, you had a great illustration with the phones and you talked about the antennas we've seen such a, we see technology advancing all the time. This was my comments when, when I made my vote, part of my comments when I made my vote uh, with the Alpine Hills uh, Tower. You know, we, we're seeing such an advancement here for us to then go to this, it seems to me like an extreme of 60 feet or 50 feet um, when we don't give the opportunity that maybe in five years, that line of sight requirement for these towers may ease. And, and it was very apparent to the applicant that they wanted to do a co-use, that they needed the 55 feet in order to have something else underneath. And, and maybe that's, you know, it was really more of a numbers uh, deal for them in order to, to pay for the tower and, and its use. So, um, but that wasn't worth it to us to put it into a residential area to exceed that so that the dollars would pan out rather than just providing a 35 foot tower that would then provide that cell phone coverage for the area. So, so these are points that I'm just really trying to make when we're looking at these heights and that's really what we're looking at. Um, and, and if I were to go, and if you're gonna ask us to go to one option or the other, um, 
option two looks cleaner to me uh, for one. I have a, I think it's very confusing under the first document when it has the major modifications and minor modification. It's more, it's just fuzzy. But then when you put in substantial increase, I noticed that that was added. I feel like that's the only thing that needs to be in there because it's well spelled out uh, under there. Um, and then if you look at that section, there's two sections, there's a section of height there's a section, a couple subsections down of concealment. When you add the word concealment and even in your presentation, it just talks about, it looks to me like under height, you have concealment and then in these areas of a facility or tower and then, but it really should be under the concealment section. I think you should keep it clean with height of the, of the tower and and then, and then when you go down to concealment, even if it's the same words, use it in concealment because down the road, I can see where people are gonna be confused on it. Um, and then also we're, I feel like we're interchanging facility and towers. I don't, I don't a facility to me is a building and then a tower is a tower or an antenna is an antenna. So, so just, just to clean it up, I don't, you know, there, it just seems like we're interchanging words. So that's my full comments on this whole deal. Mr. Chairman, may I make a comment, please? Yes, please. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Goligoski. Great comments, great uh, observations about the structure of the drafts. And I think we can, um, we can take some of those, uh, that guidance and apply it and make and clean up language uh, as as desired. Keep in mind that the function of the height of the tower is, you know, and I know that you you all are aware of this is not simply measured against the aesthetic uh, viability of it. it. It we are presented with um, the applicants data that states that they require a tower at a certain height to achieve the coverage that they are seeking to improve in a, in a given area. So while we would love to have the, the consideration of height in, in, in any given site limited to the aesthetic value, um, we have to weigh that against what has been represented by the applicant in terms of what will effect, effectively grant the coverage that is lacking in that area. So. Um, we have to be careful when we structure our code to not make, um, to, to continue to make these applications reviewable and meaningfully able to be approved if that height, the data for that height exception has been provided and um, is the best basis for us to make a decision. Um, I, I do think that moving the uh, design criteria across different types of landscape would get pretty complicated. But then again, we only get one or two of these uh, applications a year. So maybe, maybe that's not such a big deal if we were able to take the code down to that level of sort of aesthetic placement uh, priorities. Um, so that's just my comment on that part. Thank you. Any other comments? I have a couple of questions for Matt on that. Um, right now, if there's going to be an exception, it comes to PNZ, then goes to city council. So there are two reviews. If we go to the board of adjustments, it goes to the board of adjustment, then it could potentially go to the Supreme Court. Is there any limitations on appealing to the Supreme Court? And if you appeal it, do you have to hire an attorney? You're muted, Matt. Matt, you're mad at me. <laughs> Brandon, I lost you for like the last 10 seconds, so I unmuted trying to get you back. So I, I missed your final, your final comments. But um, the way the code is written and Title IX is written is that an effective property owner has the right to appeal within 30 days to the Superior Court of Arizona. And what they do is something called a record review. They're gonna look at the uh, full record that the Board of Adjustment considered and determine whether or not the decision by the Board of Adjustment was arbitrary or capricious. It's a, it's a pretty low standard. They're gonna give the legislative body, or in this case, the Board of Adjustment, a quasi-judicial body, uh, great deference. Um, that being said, this stuff is fairly complicated because you've got a federal 
um, statute involved. So I've seen cases where, um, cell tower cases, where people filed a um, claim in Superior Court for review, and the cell companies attempted to remove it to federal court because there's a federal question. Uh, the, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 is a federal statute. So there are two reasons you can bring a case into a federal court. One is that there's a federal question. And the other one is there's a diversity of jurisdiction argument. So let's say ABC Cell Terror Corporation was a Delaware corporation and the action occurs in Arizona. You've got two different states sort of involved and that's another basis to bring a case into, into federal court. Um, so I've seen it work both ways. Um, so there's sort of no easy answer on how these things get litigated. Uh, if the cell tower loses the case, they will likely, or cell tower company loses the case, they'll likely go straight to federal court and argue that somehow the city violated one of those five prohibitions that we're not allowed to consider. Um, so does somebody have to hire an attorney? No, you can always represent yourself in a superior court case. Uh, these tend to be fairly straightforward because the courts really are just looking at the record uh, of the Board of Adjustment. And they're really gonna find, did they act so out of their bounds and had no legal basis or were so arbitrary and capricious in their decision-making process that we'd have to overturn their decision. If, if it goes to Superior Court of Arizona, uh, they may send it back to the Board of Adjustment for additional findings of fact consistent with their orders. Once there's a final determination uh, made by the Superior Court, then it can get appealed uh, up to the Court of Appeals. And then if there's some compelling state interest, maybe into the Arizona Supreme Court. So, you know, there, unfortunately, there's no easy answer to this stuff. And litigation often gets complicated. And the courts are trying to figure out what are, you know, do the federal issues that way the state issues or do the state issues that way the federal issues. And that's usually where the, the case will, will wind up. Uh, under something called the abstention doctrines. So, you know, the federal courts, if it looks like a purely state decision, will probably decline jurisdiction. But if they raise some federal questions, they may accept it and then consider the state issues as well. Um, so that is a very long answer <laughs> to a very complicated <laughs> question that involves both state issues and federal issues. My second question I have is, we are looking at one height limit for single family residents and a higher height limit if you live in multifamily. So if you own a condo, you could have a higher tower next to you than if the guy across the street has a single family home. Are we discriminating against people who live in multifamily by having a higher one available for that area versus a single family. So someone could certainly make that argument. I, I, I don't necessarily think it's a winning argument. I think the way, uh, you know, traditional zoning is, has developed over the years, there, there are levels of allowable discrimination. Um, and this would probably be one of them. Okay. And with multifamily, usually they're more of a developed site instead of a single family where you have a house and a garage. In multifamily, they're more uh, disturbed sites than you would see in single family residential. And that's one of the things that the city council mentioned that um, the more disturbed sites for an allowance or more favorable sites or that have other infrastructure on it. I would also add that um, one of the other directions of council after the study session in October was that we begin to inventory um, a, the city owned properties, um, municipal properties that perhaps already have infrastructure cited to identify opportunities um, for other coverage options for the applicants. And again, when you, when you get into the public property um, scenario, it's handled a little differently, and it's um, under the umbrella of public works, and more is hand and more handled as a lease 
more of a business opportunity for the city. So we really um, don't want to only point cell towers towards city property because we don't want to get into the business of being a real estate agent for the applicants. They need to uh, site select based on their data, their coverage issues, and the, the greatest benefit to the citizens of the city that they're looking to place a wireless facility in. Thank you, Brent. Any other comments? Any comments on the proposed increase of heights to be automatic, basically automatically approved? I have a challenge with it, <laughs> you know, because if the case we had out, the last one we had, if they lowered it five feet, boom, it's done. And I have a few, I, I feel that the neighborhood should have the opportunity to make comments about that. And by setting the standards higher, it uh, takes away their ability to make any comments. Mr. Chair, if I could uh, make a comment also, this is Greg Lazell. Yes, Greg. Um, Bren, and Matt, I just, it's just a comment and I don't want a legal response, Matt, it's getting late. Uh, <laughs> um, but Turning into Paladine? Are, <laughs> when we're allowing different heights in different zoning areas, that any, that's no different than asking them a different heights in different geographic areas, is that not? I guess that's a question, not a comment. <laughs> Oh, it is a question now. <laughs> a question. I don't know, Brenda, if you want to weigh in on that, that's fine. Well, I, I had to stop and think about that for a second. I mean, I think that uh, that could bifurcate into a couple of few different scenarios. So you make a good point, um, but uh, that would also presume that all residential areas were either flat or mountainous or that all commercial areas were optimized for cellular installs. So we, we have to um, take into account that our zoning, our residential zoning, which covers the majority of our, munici of our municipal property within the city's boundaries um, is greatly varied in landscape and topography. And Yes, um, you, you could extrapolate that um, in certain areas, we wouldn't need as high of a tower as is, is proposed to be allowed here. And that allowance of up to 60 in a commercial doesn't mean that they go to 60. It just means that that would be a, a, um, an allowance set forth uh, through, the, through the code. But if you guys are more comfortable with not going in an allowed by right scenario, there are certainly other ways to craft this code. So we're open to your suggestions. Brent, I, and I'm not disparaging, I, I like the direction this is going, but I have to agree with Don, especially when it gets into a residential area, you know, to take that option of, of, of having public comment, I think is very important in our process. And that's all I have today. Thank you. Other and, comments? You know, certainly one of your options is the do nothing approach. And, you know, we have an existing code, you know, that has gotten us through since 2003. The reality is we don't have too many uh, cell tower uh, special use permits that come our way anyway. I've been here 15 years, maybe we've had 10. Um, so that, that's, that's another approach. Not, none of this stuff is written in stone. It really is a, sort of a kickoff meeting to see where you guys are at and what your comfort levels are. <clears throat> And the other thing we know is that the industry is changing rapidly and almost at the, at the pace that we really can't keep up with it. Um, <laughs> so the data and, and the anecdotal reporting out there changes daily. We, we certainly appreciate um, the, the public inter engagement and interaction. And, and I just wanna say for the record too, because we've mentioned uh, a pending application a number of times and I want to make it clear to everyone that is still a pending application. Pinnacle has asked for um, a, a pause while they negotiate with the property owner. And we're not here to litigate that, um, that request. And because it is still pending, we don't want to make decisions based on that request. Uh, that request still falls under the code that is currently adopted. 
The only way that it would fall under a different code is if we adopted a different code and they withdrew the existing application and submitted a different application for a new site. So uh, anybody that's listening that isn't concerned about that, that is the, the, the line of demarcation between that case and what we are talking about moving forward. And there's no correlation between the timing either. We are simply following the, the guidance and direction of council in wanting to look at our existing wireless facilities code and make sure that we have something that is workable within the federal framework and that also serves the citizens of Prescott. So that's the balance we're looking to strike. Other comments? Why don't we go around and have, uh, if you don't mind, each commission member comment on the proposed height changes and the proposed either doing it through board of adjustments or continue with planning and zoning. Would that be acceptable to the commission? All right, only start off. Butch, would you want to start off? You're still on mute. How's that? There you go. Okay, good. Uh, first off, I want to thank Tammy for her visual aids. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a visual guy. I like to see that stuff. Uh, and, you know, it's just like on our last one, you know, a simple map showing the coverage of a 30 foot tower compared to a 50 foot tower. It's not that hard to do. And I, and I would request that that is provided to us. I think it's pretty simple. Uh, I agree with Greg and, and Stan in that uh, giving the, the public a chance to weigh in on this is really important. So that being said, I, I'm pretty happy with what we have right now. So that's it. Thank you, Butch. Uh, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I've expressed it. Uh, the two things is I'm all for the multifamily and, and commercial and industrial, I think the, the uh, residential areas need to have a chime in on proposals that, that uh, go above the height limit. Um, I, for one, think uh, the board adjustments should handle it. That way we don't have to. <laughs> that's, uh, that's my comment. <laughs> okay, Tom? Uh, yeah, Tom Hutchison here. Um, I think the height issue has to be driven by hard data that supports what they really need and what works. So, so the idea of having latitude makes sense to me. Although I'm, I'm strongly supportive of having the public be part of the process. So it's, it's, it's gotta work at number one. And number two, the public needs to be part of it. All right, thank you. Stan. Uh, yeah, I'm in favor of cleaning up the documents. I do like that second option uh, as the, the means. It seems cleaner, um, but I would omit the height requirement uh, piece there um, and just not limit us, ourselves and actually increase to such a range, you know, to Tom's point of, of you know, there's not enough data out there. And, uh, and again, you know, technology is advancing. So um, love the visual aids there, Tammy. And uh, I have a Blackberry in a drawer that you could add to your collection if you like. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have. Thanks, Dan. Ted. It's, it's been, been such a long time, I can't remember what the two questions were. <laughs> Do we want to go with proposed height limits? Do we want to either change to board of adjustments or continue through planning and zoning for uh, reviews? Yes to the first one. On the height limits. Yeah. I'm still getting feedback. I don't know why. Try turning your volume down on your speakers. Well, I turned the computer off. Uh, and the second question was what? Going to the Board of Adjustment? Changing to Board of Adjustments or continuing through the planning and zoning as it is right now. 
Well, I concur with Commissioner Lozell. I'm okay with the Board of Adjustment. Okay. My thoughts is I think 50 feet or 49 feet or less, as the way it's written there, is too much for a residential area without the community be having a chance to say something about it. The other heights, I really don't have a challenge with. I lean toward continuing through planning and zoning because it gives two methods or two areas for, for the community to make comments. If you go to Board of Adjustment, yes, you have the ability to appeal it, but that is really putting a lot more on the public to make a question and also allows the cell company to appeal a decision too. So that's my thoughts. I don't know if that helps staff or just screws up their mind more. So Matt, with the SUP process, because it's um, approved by the city council, isn't that also appealable to uh, Superior Court? Yes. Um, and it wouldn't be kind of the same necessarily statute, as, the same statute as the Board of Adjustment, but uh, there <laughs> rarely any final decisions. So again, you know, if, if the cell company wants to bring a suit, they can. Uh, if in effect a property owner wants to bring a suit, they most likely can as well. And the so it doesn't preclude it doesn't preclude going to court. And the board of adjustment is a public hearing, so it does have the same. We post the property, we we send notices out, we ask for public comment, the same as going to the planning and zoning commission. But like you said, it is only one one meeting. But they have different criteria they're looking at. They're looking at relaxation to allow for the height rather than the land use decision that the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council usually look at. But I mean, either way, I mean, it's a we can go either direction. Or we're we can, not, I don't think I don't think for as staff we're married to one or the other. We you know we just wanted to present you with something that looked a little bit different. Um, you know, one I suppose one of the benefits having it go to the Board of Adjustment might be that by statute, they really are quasi-judicial. So they're finders of fact and they make conclusions of law. Um, and they're sort of trained a little bit differently as how to take kind of evidence and, and things like that. And given the fact that you're dealing not only with kind of a local land development code, you're also dealing with you know, the Federal Telecommunications Act. Maybe that's, a, that's an easier fit because you're dealing with two separate kind of laws that need to be kind of balanced out. So just a thought, honestly, whichever way you guys want to go, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll try to come up with, I wonder, Brandon, if, if we come up with one or two different options that the board can present to the city council. Yeah, and that's- the city council can kind of revise as to, the, you know, the way they want to go. We had intended- they could also they can also send it back to the planning and zoning commission going, yeah, we're thinking more of this. Yeah. And then you guys sausage make a little bit more. <laughs> right. So Stan, you didn't say whether you like the SUP process or going to the board of adjustments through the uh, CUP process. I like the SUP process, honestly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Are the there other any other areas that we have within either options on that that we want to discuss at this time? Or is it the height and the method of uh, handling our two main issues? Those are the two main issues. I think the rest of it was just updating language and taking out, you know, taking out old processes and stuff that we really can't ask for anymore of the new one of the um, old code. Um, the new code had a lot of the definitions, like substantial increase, that's part of FCC 6409 that we wanted to add. So we have it in our code right now. If someone comes in and wants to do um, any, if, if they want to come in and they're updating equipment, it's just a building permit. If they come in and they say they're doing an increase, but it's allowed under FCC 6409, we have to allow it, which allows for the 10% by height, you know, and all this other things. So we can't make them go through a public process. That's all allowed by federal law. So we, we want to add that language to kind of update it. So we have it in our code. 
um, and then anything else that we see that that needs to be updated to meet current uh, FCC regulations and any state statutes that comes in. It would be beneficial for you for the commission to say, we'd rather just fix what is there now or go ahead and have the new writing of that. Would that be helpful? Oh, good. Sure, definitely. Okay. Um, okay. Is there a motion one way or the other? Mr. Chair, this is actually a discussion session. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll keep that at the discussion level for now. We're gonna we'll take the input that you guys have given us today. Uh, one of the thing that seems one of the things that's coming to mind is that it seems, and this is appropriate if you guys are inclined, that we are leaning towards a hybridized version of this code presentation. So what I'm hearing is that you don't mind the allowed by right scenarios in multifamily, commercial, and industrial. Um, as presented in both of the drafts today, but the residential, you would still like the right of review and keeping the height limit at the zoning district height limit. Am I hearing that correctly? I'm seeing a lot of nods, but to yeah. Ted, Tom. <laughs> Why don't we go ahead and proceed that way? <laughs> Okay, so and that, Brent, Brent uh, what, I'm just keeping my little tally here. We've got six members. Who are we missing? I'm George Lee. Yeah, okay. George so Lee. I've got four who are leaning to maintain it at the planning and zoning level and two at the board of adjustment level. Is that what you guys are kind of? Um, that's where I see it. see it. I see Gamboji wants board of adjustment and Lazelle. And then planning and zoning, I think uh, the chairman would rather keep it there. Stan would rather keep it there. Butch would rather keep it there. And Tom would rather keep it there. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. All right. So under those circumstances, we probably would not adopt a new, or propose to adopt a new code that had the allowances by right, because specifically the BOA is tasked with code relaxation. So that would keep... Uh, all of those areas under review as SUPs by the Planning and Zoning Commission and ultimately by council. I see that. Just restating what the, I think the majority is saying. We also have the opportunity between now and the next meeting to consider this more because we're not voting on now. That's and correct. if there are change of information, thoughts and so forth, we have the ability to change it at our next meeting. Absolutely correct. So we'll take your comments and put another draft together. Um, now, whether it's ready for the next meeting, uh, questionable, it may be a, a couple of meetings the end of February for another discussion. Correct, Bryn? Yep. That works for me. Thank you. Yep. Give me some time. <laughs> <laughs> any other comments? If not, any staff updates? Um, just a note that we did have public participants today, but we had um, advertised the meeting as a discussion session. So we had agreed not to take public comment at this meeting so that we could get the discussion started and kind of arrive at a direction um, by consensus uh, of your comments. Um, and, but we do have folks that are monitoring the discussion and we're happy to have them here. We've been in touch with a lot of folks who are interested in this discussion. And just a note to the public that we will be taking public comment at the future meetings of the Planning and Zoning Commission regarding these proposed amendments. So we'll be back with an updated draft, uh, some new um, discussion material for you all. And next time we'll hear what uh, our members of the public have to say. All right. Thank you, Bren. If there's nothing else, then the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for taking time to attend by video and so forth today. Appreciate that. And stay safe out there and have fun shoveling snow. Mr. Chair, this is yes. Greg Lazell. I just wanted to show Tammy a real prop. <laughs> this is a communicator that doesn't need a cell tower. <laughs> <laughs> is that from Star Trek? <laughs> The force be with you. <laughs> live, live long and prosper. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Next time.